Hi guys. So in my last video I hooked up a graphical LCD display to the ARM2 based computer and uh, developed this program which draws the Mandelbrot on it. Uh, this is actually a fixed version of the program. You can see that uh, some of the dappling, dithering on some of the colours is no longer there. So I added a, bit, a few more lines of code there to fix that. I was actually considering uh, uploading a video with a kind of run-through of all of the code in the Mandelbrot thingy. So I don't know if that's interesting to you guys, but please do let me know in the comments if you are interested in that, and I can edit it together and upload it. Anyway, here it is rendering the Mandelbrot again. And now I've decided that the time has finally come that I no longer want to be programming all four different uh, EPROMs every time I change the program. I want to develop a solution here which allows me to change the program by only reprogramming one EPROM. Now I thought of a few different ways of doing this. I thought of things like connecting up like a, an Arduino or something like that um, and having that kind of manage things. But I don't really want to go down that route. I would like to continue using EPROMs, but I just don't want to have to program four of them. So what I'm basically going to do is pull out the EPROMs that were already in there, and I'm going to replace them with RAM. And having done that, I will then need to uh, build some other kind of circuit which can scan through all the addresses in an EPROM and copy them to the RAM on startup. Planning to do that during the reset sequence of the CPU, so when I push the reset button, um, it will trigger this sequence, it will hold the reset line low while it does it, it will take the arm off the bus so that um, I can have some counters or something driving the address bus, and then I can just cycle through all of the addresses in the EPROM um, with the EPROM set to output to the bus and uh, the individual RAM chips set to read from the bus. So let's give that a go and see how it goes. What I've done here uh, off camera um, is actually built out most of the circuit which I think is going to do this job. And I think this video is probably only going to be about this circuit as opposed to having the whole system up and running, just because there's quite a lot here to go through. Um, it's Although I've built most of it here now, um, I'd like to explain how it works and also do some testing of it. Um, and then I think it'll possibly be a different video where we actually get this properly hooked up to the ARM uh, and hopefully running the Mandelbrot program from RAM. So the general purpose of this circuit, as I said, is to uh, copy the contents of a ROM into, into RAM. The ROM and RAM are not present in this circuit at the moment. The ROM will go in this uh, location down here, um, and the RAM is actually already installed in the, um, in the ARM board over here, so uh, I don't actually need, this, need, need the RAM to be in this breadboard, or, although I might move it across at a later date. Uh, what we have in this circuit um, let's start from the bottom left hand corner. This is a pair of D flip flops, and this is kind of used to manage the whole startup process. I think the top one activates for a short period of time when the reset button is pressed or on power on. Uh, it then triggers the bottom one through this connection here, and the bottom D flip flop stays active throughout the entire reset process. During that reset process, we're going to hold the CPU in the reset state. Uh, we're also going to, to unassert its address bus enable and data bus enable lines so we'll be able to put whatever we want onto the address and data buses during that period and um, these signals are also used to kind of drive the rest of the circuit and make it do its job. Next to that are two 8-bit counters um, and these are essentially driven from the two-phase clock um, on the ARM side of things so uh, these counters will count up each phase of the clock um, and, these will list, and these will basically form the address that gets fed into the ROM and the RAM. The ROM's output enable will also be enabled by the reset signal, and um, that then gets fed through these three transceivers um, to give a 32-bit wide result, which is just the same 8 bits but replicated 32, sorry, but replicated four times. And the reason for that is we're going to have uh, four different RAM chips are going to need to have their data buses connected into this same same data, but I can't connect all the RAM data buses together because that will break when it's used in 32-bit mode by the CPU. So the RAM uh, data buses are going to feed into the top halves of these transceivers, and one of them will feed into the bottom half where the ROM is as well. And that will allow that data to flow into the RAM. So that covers this section of the board. Um, other than that, we just have some control logic up here. I think that's um, this is a 139 decoder, which is a pair of uh, two to four decoders. 
I'll explain exactly what it does in a second. Next to it we have uh, a quad 2 to 1 multiplexer. And this is just a quad NAND here, uh, which is used to kind of massage a whole bunch of the control signals for the circuit. The way the 139 decoder and the quad 2 to 1 multiplexer work together is related to how we determine which of the RAM chips should be enabled at any point in time. So during the uh, initialization process, when you know when we're counting up the addresses uh, and having the ROM feed in and wanting to write to the RAM, the ROM is only going to output one 8-bit byte at a time, and depending on the uh, parity of that byte modulo 4, uh, we're going to want to write it into a different one of the RAM chips. So the bottom two address lines, uh, as far as the ROM is concerned, are fed into this 139 uh, 2 to 4 decoder, um, and that then chooses which of the four RAM chips is going to be enabled for this uh, for this address cycle. And the RAM chips then uh, receive all of the other address bits minus the first two, uh, just as we were doing with the ARM side of things. Um, and in fact, this same arrangement is also going to work when they are connected to the ARM in order for byte writes from the ARM to work as well. So that it's the same process. I'm just driving the bus from the counters instead of uh, from the ARM itself. The multiplexer is required because depending on the type of address cycle when the ARM is connected, we're going to want either one of the RAM chips to be enabled or all of them to be enabled. And the multiplexer is basically being used here to choose between enabling just the one that the decoder said we should enable or enabling all of them. Now the 139 decoder actually has two 2-4 two to four decoders on it uh, and I'm using the top half of it to decode the top two address bits, that's address bit 25 and address bit 24, and I'm using that to choose whether it's a RAM axis or the LCD axis and so on. I'm not going to have an option there for ROM access because all of my ROM is being copied into the RAM anyway, but that does give me three different devices I could attach in addition to the RAM, and at a future date maybe I'll add another decoder or something like that to break that down more. So this circuit, as I said, I've kind of wired that up um, According to my diagrams, I haven't tested it yet, as you can see there's still bits missing. Um, I'm going to put some LEDs in here to show the uh, currently selected address. The ROM goes here obviously, um, and then yeah, I need to connect it up to the RAM and so on for it to properly work. Over here we have two floating wires here, and these need to be connected to the two-phase clock. I think this one is phase two and this one's phase one, I can't remember. I'll have to check that before I plug them in. These, this wire here is the byte versus word selector. Um, for the startup process that one doesn't matter, but when the CPU is connected uh, it, will, it will be asking for byte accesses rather than word accesses sometimes. So this one will connect to the byte versus word indicator from the CPU. Over here we have the read versus write indicator, and again, uh, during the startup process that's actually ignored. It's always going to be in write mode so that the RAM is being written to. But this, will, but this will be connected to the CPU, and after startup that will then influence whether we're in a read or write cycle. What else do we have? Uh, I think this one is the, the memory request output from the CPU. Again, not used during startup, but when the CPU is in charge of the buses, um, we only want to be doing stuff with the RAM when this line is low. Um, and this is the control input for the uh, top half of the um, 139 decoder there. So when this, when this goes high, uh, all of the RAM will be turned off. Then we have uh, these two lines here, which need to go to address 25 and address 24. And this line here is the uh, LCD enable output um, which will go to the LCD. And this replaces some of the logic I already had on the other breadboard already. Um, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. The first thing I'm going to do though is uh, wire up some LEDs and without any ROM or RAM present in the system I'm just going to check that this does function correctly. In other words that it does count up through all of the addresses using these two counters and that the various control lines, like the RAM write enable signals and the RAM chip select signals, uh, function correctly. Um, and I'll, be, I'll just be checking that based on the LED results. Anyway, I'll go away now and plug in all these LEDs and then come back and run a test on this and see how well it works.
So I've added a couple more things here now. I've added these LED banks to show the uh, address that the counters are outputting. I've added another bank of LEDs up here, which will show which of the four RAM chips are enabled. Um, these are the chip select lines for the RAM chips, so they will be active low. However, I've wired the LEDs up to the positive rail, so the LEDs will come on hopefully one by one to show which RAM chip we'll be getting written to in the current clock cycle. Over here I've also wired uh, one LED for the write enable and one LED for the output enable uh, signals to the RAM chips. And what I'm expecting is during the reset sequence, as the addresses count up, we're going to see one pulse on the write enable LED per address um, per RAM chip. And when it finishes counting through the addresses, uh, it should switch, I think, into, well, it depends on the setting of the read-write line here, which would normally be connected to the CPU, but it would then be reading or writing depending on what the CPU is asking for. Uh, so uh, I think that's about it. Oh, I've, I've hooked the memory request line up to ground at the moment so that we're always doing memory request bus cycles. Uh, the two high bits of the address bus here are wired also to ground, uh, which means that it will always consider that the address the CPU is asking for is RAM. Um, this other wire here is just the uh, output signal for driving the LCD display, which will be doing nothing here as well. Uh, and this one down here is the byte versus word line I mentioned before. Um, currently set high, so that's set to word mode. Most of those are only relevant when it ends the reset sequence. But we can test both of them this way around. What, I, what I'm going to do now is hook it up to the, uh, the two-phase clock. Going to make sure I get phase two in. One in the right place in phase one. Just making sure I get phase one and phase two in the right places. Um, I think that should be enough to make it work, so let's turn it on and see what happens. Looks good. So we're seeing all the addresses counting up, which is great. Uh, we're seeing some flickering over here uh, on the uh, RAM chip selects. Oh, they've all gone solid now. Uh, the, the, okay, so the, the count has finished. I only wired it up to do 10 bits of address space. Um, and the count has finished, so that's now flipped back from reset mode into a kind of CPU-driven runtime mode. Um, you can see that the output enable LED is on here. So the CPU, I guess, is doing read cycles. If I swap this wire high, it should switch to write cycles, I hope. Yep, so now we can see that it's performing write cycles. Go back to read cycles again. And this is only relevant when the initialization phase is finished. This is the byte not word line as well, so if I take this one low, this is currently in word mode, so all four of the RAM chips are enabled. If I take it low, it'll go into byte mode. Um, yeah, there you go. And it's only showing one of them enabled. And that's going to depend on what the CPU is putting on the bottom two bits of the address bus, so that's a good sign. I should probably test that a bit more thoroughly later by actually putting some data on the address bus. Anyway, let's um, have a closer look at what happened when it ran. Uh, one more time. Yeah, when I hold down the reset signal, it holds the address at zero. Um, it is starting to do write cycles, and you can see that it's selected uh, RAM chip zero for the address being the, the address being zero in the bottom two bits. When I let go off, that goes. Oh, it skipped something there. Hmm. I think these I think these two bits of the uh, LED are the wrong way around. I won't bother fixing that now, but that's something I'll need to fix before I properly hook it up to ROM. That's fine. Um, let's try turning the clock speed down a bit so we can get a closer look at what's happening there. That's about as slow as it can go. So we're seeing the four RAM chips get enabled one after another in the sequence. Um, and that should exactly match the value on the bottom two bits of the address bus here, because it's literally going through a decoder and up to those uh, LEDs there. So when the bottom two bits are zero, the right-hand LED comes on. Um, and as the bottom two bits count up, it moves to the left. So that's good. That's, that's exactly what we expect. The other thing is when the write enable, oh yeah, so, so the other thing is that the write enable LED is pulsing here. Uh, we don't have write enable on all the time. If we were in read mode, we would have root output enable on all the time. 
because that's absolutely fine. But with writes, you want to gate them so that they only happen after the address is stable on the, on the address bus, because otherwise you can end up uh, with the RAM sort of seeing a half a half stabilized address and you know some of the bits might be good and some might not be good and you'll end up writing to the wrong locations. So that write enable pulse should be tied to the phase two which is the left hand LED over here and it seems to be coming on at the same time as phase two But something that doesn't look as good here is the timing of the increment of the address because the address is currently incrementing at the start of phase two. That's not what I want. Remember the idea of pulsing the write enable is that we should have the address stable before write enable goes on. And right now the address isn't stable, the address is changing at the point that write enable goes on. So I think I've probably just got those two the wrong way around in the circuit here. So let's just swap. So let's just try swapping those. Oops, dropped something. So that's this one here. Uh, goes to there now. I think this one here needs to come back to there. Let's see what that does. That's better. So now you can see that the address is incrementing when the LED goes off rather than when it comes on. Um, and I think that should be fine. I'll give it a go anyway. I think I think that should be okay because the um, the LED is technically going off slightly earlier than the address is ticking up because the two phase clock has a slight delay before phase one starts after phase two ends. So there should be a tiny bit of dead time there that should be enough for the uh, RAM to stop writing before the address starts changing. We'll find out when we actually run this for real with ROM and RAM in it. And this circuit's kind of interesting because uh, a lot of the complexity here is actually only required because of the 32-bit data bus that the ARM CPU has. Um, all of this messing around with four different chip select lines for the RAM, uh, the decoder, the multiplexer, all of that stuff is only really there because it has that uh, odd architecture there. Um, if you were doing this with a 6502, you could get rid of most of the chips here. I mean, you wouldn't need all of these transceivers. Um, most of that second row there would go away. Um, and you could use something a bit like the bottom row here if you wanted to uh, preload RAM from ROM on a 6502. I think in the next video I'll actually put some put some ROM in here. I'll probably put the Mandelbrot program on the on the ROM, and then I should be able to connect the uh, four bytes of the data bus here straight through to the ARM board over there, and use that to preload the RAM. Then I've got the RAM chip select signals here. The uh, write enable and output enable signals. So I'll just wire those across to the other board um, and take out some of the control logic that was already in there and I'll see how that works but I think that'll be next time. Anyway that's it for now, hope you enjoyed that. It's nice to build a kind of whole fresh circuit from scratch. Do let me know what you think in the comments, especially if you spot me doing something wrong here, uh, some, any mistakes I've made, it'd be nice to fix them before I uh, do hook it up to the RAM. But as I say, through this testing process it seems to be working pretty well and uh, this circuit also lets me test some of the kind of ARM interfacing for the RAM as well, especially the way the address decoding has to work um, for the chip selects and stuff like that. So that was a good thing to do. See you next time.